The last session, oh, it's my pleasure to chair it. I'm Helen Redmond. I'm the New South Wales DEA rep. And I'm also convening our new divestment subcommittee. And so it's with particular pleasure that I welcome um, the dynamic Charlie Wood from 350.org. So um, she's been a climate and social justice activist for about seven years and has worked for a very impressive array of organisations, including Amnesty International, the Greens, Centre for Sustainable Leadership, and the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, where she coordinated the Australian Youth Delegation to 2009 uh, Climate Talks in Copenhagen. Charlie's currently the Australian Campaigns Director with 350.org, and she heads their Go Fossil Free campaign. And she's also worked with the Climate Institute and um, the Asset Owners Disclosure Project. And I believe she's going to talk to us about divestment. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, and I want to acknowledge the um, traditional owners on whose land we're um, meeting today and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, I just want to start with a few quick questions. So maybe just have a show of hands. Um, who here is feeling a little bit despondent about the state of climate politics in this country? Cool. A little bit like this. <laughs> um, who's feeling a little bit worried about the massive expansion plans that the fossil fuel industry currently has planned? <laughs> Hey, <laughs> good, we're off to a good start. Um, and who here has a bank account or a superannuation fund? Keep your hand up. Great, okay. Um, so you might think that those three questions are slightly um, unrelated, but bear with me. So I'm going to tell you a story today um, about a series of wars um, that are unfolding around Australia. Um, but rather than painting a bleak uh, and hopeless picture of a country and a planet in peril, I want to show how each of you, um, through your own money, actually holds a really powerful key to ending um, these plans and this state of um, gridlock um, and building a safe, and clim uh, safe climate future for all. Um, because if you have money, and I assume we all have some in this room, <laughs> um, the chances are that it's probably being used to fund the fossil fuel industry um, and their expansion plans, and probably without you even realising it. Um, but first, let's look at the state of climate politics in Australia right now. Um, if you look around, it's clear that we've kind of lost our way um, when it comes to political leadership on climate. Um, and when I reluctantly got out of bed on September the 8th, 2013, um, I couldn't help but feel it was like the 24th of June 1995 in the graveyard of Little Hangleton. Um, <laughs> the Dark Lord had returned. His name wasn't Voldemort, um, but he was set on waving his wand of green light across Australia's fossil fuel expansion plans. And these plans include um, projects like Moores Creek um, that will deliver a future of ill health to the local community there from the thousands of tonnes of coal dust that a project will release. Um, they include projects like the Galilee Basin, which would uh, destroy the Great Barrier Reef and whose cumulative emissions um, would make it the seventh largest emitter on the planet after countries like Canada and the UK. Um, there are projects like the um, Santos's um, coal seam dr gas drilling in the Pilliga or plans to frack the Kimberley and drill oil with BP and Chevron um, in the Great Australian Bight. And the projects like uh, Victorian state governments plan to dig up 33 billion tonnes of brown coal in the Latrobe Valley. So with projects like these unfolding, um, it's no surprise that many of us right now are feeling quite despondent. Um, and it's not surprising that we'd feel hopeless with a prime minister who thinks climate change is crap, um, a climate denier charged with reviewing our renewable energy target, um, an environment minister who's happy to put mining profits ahead of protection of community health in the Barrier Reef. Um, or 
a federal parliament um, that includes one of the uh, country's richest mining barons, whose pastimes include building replicas of the Titanic. <laughs> so you'd be excused um, for wondering whether this isn't some kind of Monty Python episode gone badly wrong. <laughs> but do we all just bury our, hand, our said, uh, heads in the sand? Um, no. So with political leadership on climate um, in a sorry state, it's time for us to get busier and smarter than ever. So I want to talk to you um, about a new strategy that I think we have in our climate toolbox and which I think holds a great deal of promise for pointing the um, climate leadership back in the right direction. Um, and it's divestment. So I guess one of the biggest obstacles to political action on climate change um, is that our leaders, in many sense, are being dictated to by the fossil fuel industry. Um, indeed, you know, in some cases, our, our leaders are the fossil fuel industry. Um, and it's no surprise, then, that despite the industry's super profits, um, it gets a trillion dollars in uh, subsidies globally, or 10 billion a year in Australia, um, or that you know, it receives the green light to dump um, 3 million cubic metres of dread spoil into the Great Barrier Reef, um, to drill coal seam gas, um, or that currently it holds in its reserve five times more carbon than um, the internationally agreed safe ceiling. So how do we change this? So if we're to rein in the massive political and economic power that the fossil fuel industry currently holds, um, then we're going to have to start playing by their rules to a certain extent and speaking in their language. If the industry wants to take away our planet, um, then it's time for us to take away their social licence to pollute the planet for free. And this is where divestment comes in. Um, a major bank, perhaps foolishly, revealed in a meeting last year that their worst nightmare was having their brand attached to a coal ship um, in the Great Barrier Reef. And what this shows is that um, a company's social licence and brand reputation is one of their most important assets. Um, if you take it away, you take away their licence to operate. And so the power of divestment is not in making a direct financial dent in the fossil fuel industry uh, with a company like Exxon or Rio Tinto or BHP um, that have multi-billion dollar market capitalizations. That's you know, nigh impossible. The power of divestment is in publicly exposing these companies and taking them down a notch and severing their political um, ties. Moving our money out of these companies um, is a way for us to signal that we don't support business plans that will tank the planet. Um, it's a way to give licence uh, for our leaders to regulate and rein in these plans and to start moving money into climate solutions. Um, and we know that divestment uh, works because it's been used successfully in the past. So in fighting um, South African apartheid and tobacco, divestment campaigns were successful in socially stigmatising their targets and in winning legislative and political change. And when Nelson Mandela was released from prison after 28 years, the first place he went to um, was the university campuses, places like Harvard, where the students had campaigned um, for apartheid divestment. And so I guess, you know, where do we all sit in all of this um, and what role can we play in um, pulling the rug out from under the fossil fuel industry and unlocking this political deadlock on uh, climate action? So um, we can play a huge role. Um, through our bank accounts, our superannuation funds and the public institutions that we're all here connected to, um, each of us is unknowingly funding the fossil fuel industry um, and unintentionally giving them the social licence to pollute the planet. So to start with, let's you know, take a look at banks. Um, since 2008, the big four, um, Commonwealth, ANZ, NAB and Westpac, have loaned around $19 um, billion to new coal and gas projects in, great, in Australia and many of them um, in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the big four are also leading financiers of Australia's largest new greenfields coal mine at Moores Creek. Um, and this mine will see over 500 hectares of critically endangered forests cleared, um, habitat for over 30 endangered species destroyed, and will generate emissions equivalent to the entire um, energy sector of New Zealand. Um, but we can change this. 
Um, we can pressure our banks, as thousands of Australians already are, um, to divest from these projects. We can point to not only their social and environmental risks, but also to their financial risks. Um, you see, you know, if the world uh, does, as I believe it will, get its act together to limit warming to two degrees, um, then fossil fuel projects like these are facing major risks of becoming um, called stranded assets or ridden down. Um, in fact, estimates by um, Carbon Tracker in the UK indicate that uh, the $28 trillion worth of fossil fuel assets um, currently owned by the industry, um, that $22 trillion of those would be wiped off the balance sheets if the two-degree target was met. Um, and so prudent investors are realising the risk posed by this massive, what's called, carbon bubble, um, and are starting to act before it pops. We take China, for example, um, as the health and environmental impacts of coal pollution worsen in China, um, they are taking really bold action to reduce um, their coal dependence, and uh, the Chinese Premier just recently uh, declared a war on pollution. And in recent analysis, I'm sure you guys would all be familiar that coal pollution in China um, is responsible for around a quarter of a million um, premature deaths in 2011 and a driving cause of um, birth defects um, among Chinese babies. So consequently, in top diplomats are now turning down postings to China. Um, schools are building domes to protect their children from the air pollution. Um, and in response, the Chinese government um, is really turning up the regulatory pressure on coal and introducing you know, national co a national coal consumption cap, trial carbon pricing sch uh, schemes in five major provinces. Um, and this, combined with China's leaps and bounds uh, in renewable, the renewable sector, um, leave coal projects like those being funded by our banks um, at Moores Creek and the Galilee Basin um, at risk of becoming stranded without a market. Um, but moves like China's aren't isolated. Increasingly, industrialised economies worldwide are taking action to curb their emissions um, and putting coal and other fossil fuels in the firing line. As we speak, over 60 carbon trading schemes are in place worldwide. When combined with the rising competitiveness of renewable energy, um, global measures to decarbonise the econ economy are prompting widespread predictions from experts like Warren Buffett, uh, like Premier Colin Barnett, um, analysts from Bernstein, Deutsche Bank, Citibank, that coal basically faces an ongoing um, structural decline. So these are really compelling reasons that we can put to our banks and to our public institutions and super funds about why divestment um, is not only the morally right thing to do, um, it's also financially, increasingly financially prudent as well. And if our banks um, won't engage or won't divest from these risky projects, then increasingly what we're seeing is that customers are divesting from them and are moving to uh, fossil-free banks, of which there are quite a few in Australia. Um, and on the 2nd and 3rd of May, um, around the country, there are hundreds of Australians will be uh, closing their uh, big four accounts and switching to fossil-free banks. There's some flyers outside if you're interested in getting involved. Um, and I guess, you know, they're asking you know, why they should leave their money sitting in institutions, financial institutions that are funding an unsafe future um, for our children, for them, when there are other banks um, that aren't doing that. But the banks, I guess, are just one part of the story. Um, who here has a superannuation fund? Cool. So... Right now, um, unfortunately, there isn't a single superannuation fund in Australia that doesn't have some direct or indirect exposure to fossil fuels. Um, whilst there are a handful of funds um, that have quite a low exposure, like Australian Ethical Investment and Hunter Hall, um, and whilst a number of big funds are starting to explore the creation of fossil-free options, um, thanks to pressure like individuals here, um, most of the super fund's top investments are in companies like the big four banks, like Rio Tinto and BHP. So encouraging your super fund is actually, uh, to divest is actually one of um, the most powerful divestment actions that you can take. Um, 
simply due to the sheer magnitude of wealth um, that they are currently managing. Right now, um, the superannuation pool in Australia manages $1.6 trillion. Um, that will grow by $6 trillion over the next 20 years. Um, and a large portion of that is being invested in fossil fuel um, companies and, and fossil fuel projects. Um, globally, pension money, super money, um, is the largest single pool of wealth uh, on the planet. Um, and around 55% of it is actually invested in high carbon sectors, while less than 2% is in uh, low carbon clean energy um, sectors. So what this means is that um, individuals like you and me are accidentally um, funding climate change through our retirement savings. Um, and in fact, the rise of superannuation and pension, pensions um, over the past five decades has led to kind of democratisation of capital um, so that no longer these, are these companies owned by a handful of wealthy few, they're actually owned by all of us here in this room um, through our you know, tiny slivers of ownership. Um, and that puts us in a really powerful position to um, affect change. Our super funds are legal, legally answerable to us. Um, you know, if, they, if we don't agree with the way that they're managing our money, then we can speak up about that and they have to respond. Um, and the scale of positive change is really quite momentous. Um, if the current 2% that's invested by the sector was increased to, in clean energy um, sectors was increased to about 5%, um, we'd see around $3 trillion worth of capital leveraged for clean energy technologies. And that's really enough to start tipping that sector into the game-changing phase. Um, it would also mobilise you know, capital for an industry that's in some cases up to 300 times more um, job intensive than the fossil fuel industry, yet free of all the risks like ill health and dangerous working conditions and ecosystem degradation. Um, and you, know, you can start um, by helping to build this shift today by writing to your super fund, asking them to reduce um, their fossil fuel exposure, asking them how they're investing your money. Um, and the organisation I work with, 350, and another market forces um, at the moment building a tool that enables you to go and see what your uh, super fund is investing in, send them an email asking them to change um, or supporting you to shift to a fund that doesn't invest um, in fossil fuels. For the meantime, if you head to Are You The Vital Few, you can write your super fund an email through there. So um, we've talked about personal divestment, but I guess what about you know, public and civic institutions? Um, we're standing here in a university. Um, who here is connected to you know, a university or a religious organisation or a foundation? Cool. Um, so you know, when it comes to universities, um, our unis at the moment invest in millions in the fossil fuel industry through direct share portfolios and um, externally managed funds. Um, our local councils are funding the industry through um, their banking arrangements. Um, the same goes for governments, uh, local governments, um, even you know, important cultural institutions like the ballet um, and you know, RSPCA have fossil fuel exposure in their share portfolios. Um, but each of us, through our involvement in these institutions, um, can really play an important role in educating them about these issues um, and helping them to be part of the change. And we can do this knowing that we actually have the numbers on our side. Um, so we did some recent analysis that looked at if you were to screen out fossil fuel companies from typical investment portfolio on the Australian Stock Exchange, what the financial impact of that would be. Um, and the blue line is the fossil free portfolio, the red line is the regular portfolio. In investment terms, that's no added risk. That was not risk that you would be worried about. Um, so, you know, increasingly public institutions are embracing divestment as a way of showing climate leadership, um, whilst also protecting their finances against the impacts of a carbon bubble crash. Um, here's one of our you know, uni campaigns are growing around the country. Um, and we have around nine universities internationally have committed to divest. Um, oops, sorry, 22 city governments, including Seattle and San Francisco, um, 24 religious organisations, including the Uniting Church here in um, Australia. Um, 
And the divestment movement is actually growing quite fast beyond these sort of maybe typically climate concerned um, institutions. Um, and according to a, an Oxford study, it's actually growing faster than any previous divestment movement. Um, but most importantly, oh sorry, the quote didn't come out too well in there. Um, most importantly, divestment is actually leaving an impression um, on the big investors now. So you probably heard that um, Norway's uh, sovereign wealth fund that manages $840 billion worth of money um, is looking at divesting. Um, and that following in BHP and Rio Tinto's footsteps, Len Lease just pulled um, out of Abbott Point, the Abbott Point expansion on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, even you know, people like um, the World Bank are starting to sing divestment praises. And as more and more of these announcements um, occur, um, we can actually really start to leverage enough political and financial capital um, to drive the transition away from fossil fuel based economy towards one of clean um, energy. So um, just to conclude, you know, although climate politics um, in this country is in a pretty dire state, um, each of us <laughs> does hold a really powerful set of keys um, to turn this around um, through our hip pockets. Um, and you know, if our leaders won't listen to us, then it's, turn to t it's time to turn up the volume. Um, but let's also turn our attention to the reasons why you know, the massive handcuffs that they're currently being held in by the fossil fuel industry um, take that social license away. Um, so I hope that you'll join me and look forward to working with you guys over the coming months um, and years to use our dollars and cents to turn this ship around. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Charlie, that was just a fantastic presentation. Take that uh, one off. I, I didn't know I'd get so many laughs out of it, actually. But you did the visuals very well. Um, uh, any questions from the floor? I've got a couple of texting, texted questions. Okay, do you, do you want to get the microphones to the people? And I'll start with one of these. So, the first one is, thank you for all the divestment information you've put out there. I'm finding it hard to work out how to actively invest in clean energy. Do you have any advice? That's from Kristen. Sure. Um, one of the things us as um, campaigners and NGOs have to be very careful about is not providing financial advice. Um, but there are a number of um, financial advisors out there who I'm happy to put folks in contact with who can provide that kind of advice. And increasingly, um, there are portfolios coming on the market that do have that strong focus on low carbon and clean energy technologies. Um, and not just portfolios, but you know, projects like solar farms that we can be investing in community um, owned renewable projects. So I'm um, happy to provide, follow up with some particular advisors who might be able to help more on that question. Um, so I was talking recently to my dad who manages a credit union um, about divestment and one of his questions to me was that whilst um, people invest their money in the credit union, the credit union itself, even though it has several thousand accounts, that account is linked to one of the four major banks mm. and he was asking me, well, if I don't put our money there, where do I put it as a credit union? Mm, not as sure. an individual. So, I mean, there are um, smaller banks and credit unions that aren't linked back to the big four, but I think it probably goes to show that we also need to be obviously working to encourage the big four to see beyond fossil fuels as well, because at the moment, you know, they're dominating the market. Um, and a lot of the smaller financial institutions are very dependent on them, like credit unions. And, you know, if you look at super funds, the big four banks are often in the top 10 holdings of the super funds. So um, everything is all very interlinked, which is why, you know, we need to be putting pressure on them whilst also um, finding those fossil free alternatives that do exist at the moment. And, sort of driving more demand towards them, if that makes sense. It's a question of when you actually do make that shift, you've got to make it really clear why you're doing it and write to your bank, your bank manager, speak to the person behind the desk when you do it, use every single opportunity to, to get the message through to them that 
that as a customer you're no longer choosing them for that particular reason. Mm. Definitely. Any others from the floor? Yes? Marianne. Thanks very much for that. That's been a really clear uh, explanation of uh, the reasons for divestment. Um, just recently, with the contamination of an aquifer in New South Wales by the coal seam gas industry, some shareholders have used their shareholding mm. to have some questions raised uh, in a forum with the company Santos. So I was wondering if you could discuss the pros and cons of shareholder activism, I think it's called, as opposed to divestment and the sort of balance between those. Definitely. Um, and, you know, I should have said at the outset... Divestment is one tool, it's not the be-all and end-all, and engagement is really important. And in fact, we've been talking to a lot of the super funds, that's one of the main reasons they often argue against divestment, is that if we sell our shares in those companies, we no longer have that um, you know, influence or leveraging power. So it's a fine balance between you know, trying to put pressure on those companies through having a share or a stake in them, like what Santos is doing, which is what the Wilderness Society and GetUp are doing with Santos, which is really important. Um, and also, whilst also having that kind of threat of, you know, if you don't do, we will move our capital. I think it's a balance of both of those things. Um, is that... Thanks very much indeed, and thanks very much for a very engaging um, presentation. No, it's it's hard to talk to people about money and finances and get them to engage, <laughs> and that, and that essentially is my point. I mean, I don't know the percentage, but whenever you read anything about superannuation, and it's something I am personally quite interested in, um, it, it it always um, comes across that people don't even know what's in their balance, far less where what's in their balance is being invested. Yeah. And so something like this has to be a, a kind of a multi-prong attack because there will be the knowledgeable few who will take control of their own money, but it has to be at an institutional level if we're going to have a population effect. So mm -hmm. it was actually more of a comment than a, than a question, but it's terrific to see this picking up pace. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, that's so important. There was some work, really great work done by the Australia Institute last year just on that point about how engaged we are about our super funds and, as you said, very, very low level of engagement. I, I like to think, and I think it is starting to change, that more people are uh, becoming aware of the links between their money and these broader social and environmental issues and actually starting to put pressure on the funds. And one of the benefits of that low level of engagement with super funds is that when it when someone does raise an issue, there is prick up straight away because they don't often hear about anything. Um, so, you know, it actually doesn't need to take a huge number of people to elevate issues around climate risk and fossil fuel use um, to the boardrooms of these super funds because at the moment they're just not hearing from their members. Thanks, Charlie. I guess it's a matter of... Um people understanding that there's a real risk of not doing anything. There's no risk of doing something, according to the graph Charlie presented, but there's a huge risk of not doing something. Um, do, we ha do we have any more quick questions for Charlie before we move on? OK. This lady here. It's particularly hard in Queensland where we don't get to choose where our super goes. So when you look at the balanced funds and that sort of stuff there, there seems to be an increasing number of fossil institutions rather than a decreasing. Mm. as they all greenwash themselves. Mm, is there any suggestion for those of us who can't choose the fund? Yeah, um, and we've been um, working a bit with Unisuper, so I mean, if you're um, working in the tertiary education sector, you're in a similar position that your super has to go um, into Unisuper. Um, I think the point there is not about switching to another fund, but is trying to encourage those funds to actually reduce their fossil fuel exposure and respond to demand from members to, um, you know, actually create, say, starting with options, but moving on to reducing fossil fuel exposure across the board. So, um, you know, our approach to super has been um, try and agitate for change within your fund before switching to another fund. Obviously, that sort of threat of switching has to be in the background sometimes to motivate the funds to do something. Um, but more often than not, um, they are tending to be fairly responsive. So, um, yeah, happy to talk to you more about ways and means of actually getting them to listen. Um, Thanks. One last question. Hi, Charlie. Um, 
I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about um, how divestment could affect sort of the front line of coal and carbon developments. Like you mentioned Moores Creek earlier and um, oh. sort of the, how you know medical students or doctors could be able to work yeah, with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, the topic of Moores Creek is a really important one. I was actually just up there um, last week um, and again, if anyone here has a big four account, we're connected to Moores Creek because they are the leading um, finances, financiers of that project um, led by ANZ. We don't know exactly how much of the loan they're providing, but it's a large portion of it. Um, so again, by starting to signal to those banks that we don't agree with them putting money into this large new coal mine that's going to spell devastation for local communities and the climate and the local um, ecosystems there, um, we can really start to um, make some inroads uh, to that project. Obviously, divestment is one part of it. We also need um, people up there um, as well. Um, so, yeah, very happy to um, talk more about that. I'll be back again tomorrow, and I know there's some people who are keen to um, talk more about Moores Creek. Great. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you.